We are all good. Hey, you know what? Let's give a round of applause to the, the praise team and everything that makes this happen. You know, on Sunday mornings, um, volunteers make the, the church take place. There's, there's very few paid people in place that get to do what I do and, and get to talk to you about Jesus and everything that you see, uh, generally all the way down to the handing out of bulletins is done by volunteers. And so on Sundays like this, where things are a little bit discombobulated and some TVs don't work and the tech fails, God's still glorified. And, and we praise him. And uh, one of the coolest things last service, and it'll probably embarrass him, and I'm sorry, buddy, I'll probably be your pastor your whole life, is um, little Eli comes down and he runs the, the, the lights and a lot of these things for us. And little Eli comes down to me and he goes, Pastor Blake, I just want to let you know, um, you know, this is what's going on. And I said, buddy, I just want to let you know, I'm so happy that you're serving Jesus and that you're in church. That's what it's all about, is to serve the God who serves us. And um, so uh, be kind with us as we're figuring everything out. We'll get it going. They got a lot of change that's been happening too. Their new pastor is changing everything over these last 10 weeks. So bear with them. It's all my fault. They're doing a wonderful job. Uh, this is an opportunity, though, to, um, to really, uh, an opportunity to continue our worship through generosity uh, today. Um, I want to always carve out a time and a space to give to the person who provides for us. And that is this time right now. And at Gloucester County, there's three different ways to give. If you're sitting in the front row, go ahead and pull back uh, your... Um, or reach behind you and pull out an envelope. Everybody else, the envelopes are in front of you. You can give that way. You can give online, um, and you can give at the kiosks outside. Either way that you decide to give, God will bless both the giver and the receiver. And I always like to say, here in church, and really wherever we're at, um, we don't give to God, we give back to God, because all that we have is his. So this is an opportunity for you to give back to God all that he has given to you, and I just wanted to take a moment to be able to pray over that offering, and then we'll jump into God's word. Let's pray. Father, you are so good, and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And Lord, as this is a time for us to express our generosity in giving back all that you have already given us, we do pray that you'll bless our offering, bless our tithes. Lord, allow us to continue to be faithful um, to serve you and to be faithful um, to give so that your kingdom can move forward. We love you. Thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray always. Amen. Well, as you've been accustomed to over the last eight weeks or so, I always like to give a little bit of organizational news today um, because we are a family. So here's what's taking place in your family. I want you to be in prayer um, for two uh, families specifically. Um, one, the Buchanan family, as Amy um, passed away. She's a faithful uh, servant of the church, faithful member that served right there in the bookstore. Be in prayer for her family, her son, and her father, who she leaves behind. And then also be in prayer for our dear friend, uh, Mr. George Wilson, as he lost a sister. Just be in prayer for him and his family um, as well. But Oftentimes in families, as there's time, a little moments of sorrow, there's also moments of celebration. And two faithful members, people that have grown up at Gloucester County Community Church, um, got married a couple days ago. Becca and Ryan got married. Um, I don't know what they could be doing outside of being on church on Sunday. It's like it's their honeymoon or something. So I, I you know, I don't know. But Ryan's faithful. He's always back there playing the bass, you know, with the cool hat on, you know, kind of doing his thing. And uh, Becca's always taking pictures. So we're, we're thrilled that they were able to continue um, that and continue in covenant. And we honor that. We bless that. And, and I want to hear from you. If you're like, Pastor, you didn't share my story. It's because I didn't know or I forgot. So tell me. Um, tell me so I can, I can share what's taking place. I want to update you on what's happening in your family. If you're brand new to this family... If you're brand new to this family or really kind of exploring whether you want to be a part, uh, my name is Blake. I am the senior pastor here at Gloucester County Community Church. I welcome you. I'm so happy that you're here and uh, you came on a perfect day because today we're going to jump into a brand new sermon series called Steadfast, the Unchanging Love of God. 
steadfast, the unchanging love of God. Now, this is going to be a unique sermon series. This week, we're going to teach the first 22 verses of Psalm 136. So I'm going to talk fast. You got to listen faster. And then not next week, but the week after next. The week after next, I'm going to preach the last four verses. You may think, Pastor, well, what's happening next week? Next week is Veterans Day weekend, and uh, I will be away, and I will be preparing the sermons, the series, the calendar, praying over the books that God wants us to teach next year. While um, last year, Pastor Bruce had booked his friend and vet, Henry Myers. He'll be here and encouraging you, speaking um, speaking on Veterans Day and how that ties in to our faith. I'm encouraged by it. I hope I'll be viewing online. Um, so I hope you're able to see, uh, be here in person and we're going to be able to do that. Um, so we're excited to jump into this passage today. And in a moment, we're going to read a pretty large portion of scripture. Um, normally I, I preach out of like eight to 10 passage or verses in, in, a, in a script that today I'm going to literally speak over 22 of them. Um, so we're going to read a big passage of scripture. And whenever we read scripture, I want you to understand that scripture stands on its own. Like the Bible tells us, um, as Paul talks to young Timothy, he tells him, don't neglect the reading of scripture, the public reading of scripture. And what you normally hear me do is you'll just normally hear me read a passage, explain a little bit, read a passage, explain a little bit. But today I wanted to take us back a little bit. I wanted to take us back to our Christian roots. I want to take us back in Christian history. If you're brand new and think this is a little weird, it's just something that Christians do. Um, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to everybody stand with me one more time. It's the last time I will make you stand in service. Um, Dan's going to make you stand again at the end so he can worship. And this is what I want you to do. We're going to read um, Psalm 136, 1 through 22 together. And here's how I want to read it. If we can get those verses on the screen already, I'm going to read the first phrase. And then church, I want you to repeat for his steadfast love endures forever. There's 22 verses we read and the verse ends with his steadfast love endures forever. That's your line. All right. So this is what we're going to do. I'll read that first part of the verse and you reply back to me. His steadfast love endures forever. Sound good? Everybody ready? All right, let's do it. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. To him who by understanding made the heavens. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights. The sun to rule over the day. The moon and stars to rule over the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. And brought Israel out from among them. All right, this time do it without looking, all right? With a strong hand and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his law and his host in the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings. And killed mighty kings. Shahan, king of the Amorites. And Og, king of Bashan. And gave their land as a heritage. A heritage to Israel and his servant. Thanks, you may be seated. You did a great job. A great job. Do you get a little bit about what the passage is about? 
a little bit. I mean, Psalm 136 celebrates the steadfast love of God, and it, it really emphasizes the steadfast love of God. We, we remain steadfast in all that God has done and all that he is doing. This phrase specifically shows up 30 or 26 times in Psalm 136, one after every single verse. Really interesting the way this is written. With an emphasis like that, I think it's pretty important that we understand what steadfast means. Uh, we'll do a little bit of a deep dive here today. Um, the Bible, it was originally written, the Old Testament, in Hebrew. So the Hebrew word for steadfast is hased. Hased. And that word is interpreted loosely as God's loving kindness. I love DJ Williams, pastor, the way he describes this word. This is what he says. He said, chiefly, the term is used of God's relationship with his people. And in this context, the notion of grace rather than obligation comes to the forefront. The notion of grace rather than obligation comes to the forefront. And that's incredible. When we talk about God's loving kindness, the notion of grace, he goes on to say this. That is the steady, persistent refusal of God to wash his hands of his faithless and erring people becomes the essential meaning of the Hebrew word. What does that mean? It means whatever position that you find yourself in, if you are part of God's family, his love is postured towards you in forgiveness, in faithfulness, in grace. I, I love that, that David writes this specifically. For those of you who are maybe newer to church, King David had a, had a really incredible life. A lot of good and a lot of losing. <laughs> a lot of bad. And he writes, phrase after phrase, his steadfast love endures forever. What this is saying is that God's steadfast love is relentless, unconditional, endless pursuit of the people in his family. His action in this world is spurred on by his loving kindness towards us. And it comforts us to know that whether we are faithful or faithless in this season, God is steadfast in his love if you're a part of his people. So with that in mind, I want us to dive into Steadfast, a sermon about on God's unchanging love. Part one, first point in this is God's love is on purpose. God's love is on purpose. Now look, in, in some ways, this will seem like a really uh, like ABC baseline sermon. And in other ways, we're going to get really, really deep. So wherever you connect today, I want you to be able to grab something and walk away with it because that's what we truly believe. Today is the day to where we come together as a church family or you're here as a seeker to say, what is all this about? But if you're here as part of the church family, you're thinking, what can I take home today and apply to my life tomorrow? Right, so we're going to dive into this fundamental truth. Number one, God's love is on purpose. This is what we see. The psalmist tells us that God's steadfast love is something to be celebrated for all of time. In the first three verses, this is an introduction of praise to God. And then right after those first three, verses four through nine, then turns into a description of all of God's creative acts. The repetition of his steadfast love endures forever shows that God created everything out of his love and by his love. And, and what scripture does, and it continually does this, understand you don't have two gods, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New. You have a God that teaches in the Old Testament and then confirms it in the New Testament. And this is what he does in John, because John reiterates this word, we love because he first loved us. He's confirming what the psalmist wrote. We see in this passage specifically a general creation of love, but that's not just where God stops. He didn't just generally create the world and say, I love this place. He specifically 
created the world and you and said, I love you. You have a purpose. You have a plan. Our, our founder put it this way. You were born with value and purpose. That stems from the understanding that God's love is purposeful in global creation, in general creation, but also in specific creation of you. If you don't think this is true, look at Jeremiah. Look at what God said to this individual specifically. He says to Jeremiah 1, verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. What does this look like? He's saying, Jeremiah, I have a specific plan and purpose for your life. And that's this just not a specific plan and purpose for Jeremiah. That's a specific plan and purpose for you. God didn't just create the world and say, all right, let it blossom. He created the world with specificity directed toward you because God's love is purposeful. This is a foundational truth. We must understand that our purpose is brought back to creation. And in our purpose, as God created us purposefully and for a plan and for a mission, he allows us to then function properly if our foundation is poured into that truth. I was born with value and purpose. Why? Because this is foundational. Look, look if you ever wonder how to destroy like a, a, a big building, a storm-proof building where hurricanes come and things don't, things don't move and, and everything like that. If you ever look at how they destroy those buildings, what they do is they place the dynamite at the feet of the foundation. Why? Because if the foundation can be shaken, then gravity will take control and gravity will run its course and everything else will fail. If you ever wondered why original sin took place, it's because the enemy specifically and poignantly went at the foundation of the faith, which is God loves you on purpose. That's what he had Adam and Eve question. He's saying, does God really love you if he put that barrier there? He, he, he's not letting you eat from that one tree, right? He made them question God's love, his purposeful love for their life. And he does the same for me and you. It may not come from the fruit on the tree, but maybe for you, it's something a little bit different. Maybe for you, it's the boundaries of marriage. Like, would God really love me if I specifically, like, you know, went outside the boundary of marriage in which he created like, does God really love you if he put that boundary there? Like, if I walk out of and into a different specific sin, how is God loving me if he set this boundary? And what, what the Bible is telling us here is that God's love is purposeful for you so that he can bless you and so that you understand that with boundaries become blessings. The boundaries that God has set in your life are there to bless you, not to hold you back. This has been true in your life. You just, you don't realize it yet. Here's where it's true. Um, for those of you who have a budget in the room, you know that the boundaries you set with your money end up blessing you in the future. Right? Like when we have boundaries in our budget, they bless us. Like, like those of you who have actually entered into a life-giving marriage, you're realizing that it's way more fulfilling to have the boundary of one man and one wife than to step outside of the Bible's boundaries. There's more blessing in marriage in that than there's not. You've set boundaries with your children, I hope. And you've realized that your relationship with your children actually functions much better and in a way more healthy way when you set boundaries of correction or set boundaries of health for your children. Why? Because out of boundary bring, brings blessing. And what the enemy likes to do is saying, love creates no boundaries. But what God says is, love creates boundaries that are safe. Because God designed you purposefully to be in love with him. Look, maybe, 
maybe you're here today and you don't have that foundation. Like a lot of us in the room understand that this is our foundation and it can't be shaken. And in a moment, we're not just going to talk about the, the purposeful love of God. We're going to talk about the present love of God. Because a lot of us in this circumstance, we're Christians, right? We stand here and we're worshiping God and we're, we're, we're praising God and we're, we're understanding deeper about, okay, my foundation truly is built on God's purposeful love. But there are some in the room that you've never experienced that purposeful love yet. You've never experienced God's purposeful love. And for you, the talk today stops right here. For you, the, the, stop, the, the talk today ends right here. This is what I want you to do. I want you to understand that God loves you. That the reason, where, the reason you're walking through things and the, the foundation may be you know, shaky, the reason why you're walking through life and, and, and you feel like you're just being pulled every which way is because you've not placed your foundation in the person of Jesus. So I can't talk to you about God's present love and, until you've built your foundation upon his purposeful love. So this is what I want to do. I want to stop right here. And I want to tell you how you can build your foundation purposefully on the love of God. At Gloucester County Community Church, we say it's as easy as ABC. For the last 40 years and for the next, as long as I'm your pastor, we're going to be sharing with people how to put their foundation in the purposeful love of Jesus. Most of you in the room have already done this, and if you have, this is what I want you to do. For those of you who have put your foundation in the purposeful love of Jesus, I want you to pray at this moment, because there are those in the room who need to. And we've been teaching people how to share their faith this way for years, and we'll continue to place your foundational love in the purposeful love of Jesus or to place your foundation in the purposeful love of Jesus, this is what I want you to do. I want you to A, admit that you're not perfect. This part should be easy. Admit you're not perfect. The Bible calls those imperfections sin. And you see, the standard of having a relationship with God is perfection. So because of those imperfections, we can't. But God loved you so much that he didn't want those imperfections to keep you away from him. So he sent Jesus to live perfectly, to sacrifice a perfect life on the cross and to raise again three days later. So we have to admit, number one, that we're not perfect, and then we have to believe in what I just told you, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again the third day. then we must commit, commit our lives to him through prayer, through belief. We're gonna do that in a moment together. And we're gonna do it today. Because we can't hear about the present love of God until we understand the purposeful love of God in which we build our foundation. For those of you in the room who need a firm foundation, pray this with me. All heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. Lord, I admit that I'm not perfect. I believe that you died on the cross for those imperfections. And I'm committing my life to you today. Help me to live for you. I love you. Amen. You can look up here again. For those of you who made that decision, this is what I'd like you to do. The most important part of what took place just happened in your life. You just poured a new foundation, and I want to help build on that foundation. Your church wants to help build on the foundation that you and Christ just laid in your heart. This is the way to let us know and to help us help you build on your new foundation. Behind me or up on the screens here, you'll see a few different ways. On the way in, you've got a connection card hit right there. I've decided to receive Jesus. Maybe you're more technolo technologically driven and like to email me at blake at GCCC Pray, 
or text the word PRAY to 856-861-4144. Please do that today. Solidify your foundation so that you can understand that that God's love is, is not just purposeful, but now it can also be present. So for those of you in the room who have already laid your foundation in the purposeful love of Christ, what I want to help you understand now is that same love that you laid your foundation upon is still purposeful and present in your life right now. You see, my fear for Christians is this, is that we place our foundation in the purposeful love of Jesus. We place it in the acts of creation. We place it in his purposeful design for our life, but we don't live in the power in the presence of God's love. You, you see, what happens is the, the, the author of, of this psalm, he goes from the purposeful love of God to the present love of God. In Psalm 136, 10 through 22, he lists historical acts of which Israel and other believers like ourselves would remember, such as when God parted the Red Sea, crossed the Jordan during Israel's exodus. All of these things the psalmist lists so that we understand that the steadfast love of God is purposeful, but it's also present. That phrase says it endures forever, forever. From the beginning of time until the end of time, the steadfast love of God is always present. For those of you who want to take a deep dive on the fruits of the Spirit, this is what we're talking about. As we look at the fruits of the Spirit, we understand that the only fruit of the Spirit that remains in heaven is love. Why? Because faith... We, we won't need faith there. We'll be in his presence. Hope. What are we hoping towards? We're there. But love endures forever. And you see, as, as we understand that God's love was purposeful for us, we must understand that it's also present with us. It was present for Joshua, for those of you who have been with me. We see it in his monumental moments of of capturing Jericho. It was present there, but it was also present in his lowly moments of falling to Ai. And, And you've seen it too in your life. You see, you, sometimes we can wonder, where's the love of God at? Where, where, where is it present in our life? And sometimes it shows up in a lot of different ways. God's love is both um, amazing and, 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 and overwhelming, but it also can be chastising. God's love is corrective, but it also brings peace. God's love reminds me of a river. Like, bear with me. This is what it reminds me of. The Arkansas River begins in Leadville, Colorado, and snakes through mountains 152 miles long. This river includes small valleys and a 4,500-foot drop-off. The river's vast. And through that river, or through um, all of these things, it winds around rocks and it goes into crevices and it continues to move and to, to blend. Wherever it finds itself, the water is still running. The force and constant movement of the water is running slowly against the walls of the canyon and eroding some of those hard rocks and cutting the canyon even deeper and deeper each year. You see, God's faithful love in our life can sometimes feel like that river. It's mending and winding around the curvatures of our life and heart. And sometimes it can feel overwhelming like a waterfall. And sometimes it can feel corrective as it's shaving off those hard edges. But it's always present. It's always near. It's never unattainable. For those of us who have have placed our purposeful foundation in his purposeful love for us, we must understand that God's love is present and with us, regardless of the place in which that river of love takes us. 
Maybe you've been like me and you've, you've been in a position to where you just feel like you didn't feel the love of God. If any of you been in that, what I call a head to heart conundrum, the nine inches from my mind to my heart, I, I know it here, but I can't feel it here. Like, God, I, I know you're there and I want to connect with you, but, but sometimes it feels so hard and I, I know it here, but it's hard to connect it here. Like, God, I, I'm, I'm with you and I'm, I understand, like, theologically that your love is with me, but in my heart of hearts, I, I, I'm struggling to feel it. I'm struggling to feel it. David tries to convince himself of this as he writes another psalm. It's beautiful. Listen to, listen to how David describes God's present love in your life. Psalm 139 8 through 12. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up into heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest ocean, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Jeremiah puts it this way. Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Like this, this feeling and convincing, oftentimes we, we go over and over and over again and say, God, I need to feel your love. I need to feel your presence. God, I want to connect with you. I, I want to grow deeper in my relationship with you. I desire to grow deeper with you. And we must understand in order to go deeper with God, we have to understand that his love is not only purposeful, but it's also present. Now, you know my desire for you today is to take something home with you. And this has been a different message than you've heard me preach in time past, right? I'm normally like the fun, like story guy. Tell stories, share things, throw rocks at people, umbrellas, splash water everywhere. But I want you to walk away with something today. And, and today, where my heart, where I believe the Lord led us to this place, is I believe you, like me, have been in a spot to where you just sometimes can't seem to connect with God. Like you've, you've prayed and, and you've heard messages like, get rid of the blessing blocker in your life and, and you've repented of your sin. And sometimes still you don't feel connected. Like we come and worship every week, but every once in a while I, I walk away and I wonder, God, do you know that I'm here? I want to help you. A few years ago when I was um, recovering from my, uh, my uh, broken leg, I was really frustrated because I wasn't able to connect with God in the way that I wanted to. Um, I couldn't, I didn't feel like I was connecting. I was still reading my Bible. I was still praying. I was connecting with God to the best of my ability and I couldn't seem to feel the presence and I, I didn't understand why. Well, one of the reasons is because I connected with God in a community of people and I couldn't be around my community of people. It was frustrating. One of the ways I realized that I connected with God was through nature and I, and I couldn't get outside to pray or, or to walk or, or to do anything. One of the ways that I connect with God is intellectually. I like reading theology and I, I never could find the space because I was on you know, medicine for my leg and I couldn't think clearly and I was, I was frustrated. And somebody gave me this book um, by Gary Thomas, incredible pastor. It's called Sacred Pathways. And talks about nine different ways to connect with God. So over the next nine hours, I'm going to teach you individually one way for the next nine hours. No, over the next few minutes, I just want to briefly touch on nine different ways to connect with God. So that you can have an appreciation for your family that may connect with God differently than you do. So that we can show grace properly. We can show mercy properly. We can be in unity more properly. In a time and a place of thanksgiving that we're in, but also in a time of, of a place of division in which we are in. 
I want this to be a specific moment to where you can take and say, wow, that person in my church connects with God this way. Oh, they're making it up there. I don't know if that one's going to make it. Um, <clears throat> and this is the way I want to do it. Number one, oh, we're going. That's all right. The naturalist, loving God outdoors. Loving God outdoors. Naturalists feel closest to God when they're surrounded by God's creation. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you. Learn their best lessons from outdoors. In particular, being outdoors helps them to visualize scripture, see God more clearly, and learn to rest. There was a member of your church that came up to your pastor out, out after service and said, Pastor Blake, I, the, the water for me, like the water is amazing. And he, he told me all these incredible things about water that I didn't understand, still don't really understand. But it was amazing because that's the way he connected with God. It was incredible. Sensates are awed by the presence of beauty and feel closest to God when they can see, smell, hear, or even almost taste his majesty. They're drawn to all and beauty, splendor. Uh, Senates are drawn to expressions of all and beauty. Architecture, classical music, art, formal language move their heart deeply. Our founder finds God in pieces of art. He has for years. It's beautiful. It's incredible. Traditionalists, loving God through ritual or, or symbol. While other spiritual temperaments might see this as lifeless rituals, traditionalists find these practices to be life-altering experiences. You see, there's some people that understand it's Jesus plus nothing equals everything, but they still really like to celebrate Passover. That's great. Don't damn them for that. Like there's, there's some people that understand that I do not need a prayer shawl to pray. But man, pastor, for some reason when I put that on, whew, I feel connected to God. Does everybody have to? No. This is a way some of your church members, some of your family connects with God. Traditionally. Aesthetics. Loving God in solitude and simplicity. Aesthetics gravitate towards solitude, austerity, simplicity, and deep commitment. Aesthetic self-denial doesn't stem from being a martyr or punishing oneself, but rather as a means or way to love God more. Activists, loving God through confrontation. Yeah, you heard it right. Through confrontation. Activists feel closest to God when they're standing against injustice. Many activists hear many different causes here in your church, in your place. As they face injustice, they feel like they are working in cooperation and partnership with God. Activists readily engage in confrontation and challenge for the sake of truth and justice and what they believe to be right. What does the Bible tell us? To stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves? All of these are rooted in scripture, guys. Caregiver, loving God by loving others. Caregivers love God and feel most connected to him when loving and serving others. Caregivers are filled up if you're like, hey, you may not be able to go to church today, um, but you can serve like 20 hours this week. It's awesome. They'll hold plates whenever something's wrong. They're generally the people, you know, if they hear me cough, they'll throw up a water, try to hit me in the head with it. Like that's a caregiver. They want to serve. They feel connected to God by serving. Amazing. Amazing. Enthusiasts tend to be the cheerleaders of the faith. Enthusiasts you'll generally see in the first couple rows. They're awesome. They're dancing for Jesus. Dancing up the aisles, shouting amen, worshiping with joyful celebration. They experience God's power and presence best when their hearts are moved and they feel his presence. Contemplatives, loving God through adoration. 
Contemplatives adore God. They set their gaze on him and seek to be present in his presence. Contemplatives feel closest to God when their emotions are awakened and they sense God touching their heart and speaking words of love and affection towards them. Contemplatives generally would rather be alone than sitting through formal liturgy or taking a walk outside. And intellectuals, loving God with the mind, you'll generally find these people protecting proper doctrine. You'll likely find them studying or debating hard truths in scripture. Intellectuals feel closest to God when they learn something new about him that they didn't understand before. Church, there are probably plenty more. This is what helped me, so I hope it helps you. And you may say, well, if I connect with God that way, then, then why do I need to be here? And here is where I would say, this is the place of equipping so that you can connect with God all your numerous different ways and so that you can bring more people right here to what I would call family dinner. This is where you as an enthusiast can connect with the contemplative and you can look at them and say, wow, they so respect and honor and they're so overwhelmed by God's love. And they look at you and say, look at that emotional expression and look at what God's doing. And then they look over and they see the traditionalist and they say, I can't believe that they love that. That's amazing. It's beautiful. Then they look at the piece of art on the wall and they say, I could never do that, but I appreciate that person that does. And then they look at the intellectual and go, I I didn't understand any of those words, but they're amazing. God didn't create us as one expression. He didn't limit himself. He wants to connect with you, and, and you probably connect with God in many of these ways. But maybe you're in a point in your life right now that it's time for you to try a new one. It's time for you to try something else. Maybe you've been such an intellectual that you've become a critic of church rather than an enjoyer. Maybe you've been a caregiver for so long that you've begun to burn yourself out. Maybe it's time for you to begin to experience God's love in different ways. This so helped me and I hope it helps you. I... I'm going to end with a quote here, and then we're going to worship together. The chapel will be open. One of my favorite pastors, Timothy Keller, says this, and I want to tie it all back to remembering, we, we understand that the, the foundational truth is God's purposeful love, but his love is not just purposeful, it's also present. And because of his present love, we can connect with God in many different ways. And this is what I would encourage you to say. No matter how you connect with God, this is one of my favorite quotes to understand. You don't really know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. When everything in your life is relatively stable, we can easily forget the presence of God, the presence of his love. Take time this week in season of thanksgiving to remember how your life is changed by God's purposeful and present love. Let's pray. Father, you're good and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for loving us and we understand that we love because you first loved us. Lord, allow us to bask in the purposeful and present love and connect with you in numerous different ways this week. Lord, we love you. Help us to love you more. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.